Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Fitness Pro Mentors Podcast. And I'm super excited because honestly, today, uh, there's some superstars here and people that I'm intimidated to be in the same room with. But gosh, I'm super excited. Two great friends, two great mentors. And I'll add the first one here to get this thing started off. Uh, Mr. Charlie McMillan, who is, you know, pretty awesome. Charlie, how are you doing today? I'm doing okay. Thanks, Brandon. How are you? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. I uh, I was thinking a little bit about getting this whole thing started and bringing in some Bowflex expert to perhaps talk about some unique technology and see how we could uh, create a new infomercial. What do you think about that? Well, I think that'd be pretty good, although, uh, yeah, I've got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell you what, honestly, Tom, welcome, and uh, here we go. All right. <clears throat> No Bowflex shit, okay? <laughs> no Bowflex. Oh, that's literally like three questions I had. That's brutal. I can't All answer right. that. So, <laughs> All right. No problem. Well, I'm super excited. I mean, honestly, we were chatting and both you guys said some really interesting stuff to bring to the table. And I mean, uh, Tom, when you brought this idea up, there were some things that you said, hey, I, I would love to talk to Charlie about. Uh, where would you like to get this whole thing started? Well, gosh, it's a vast subject. I think the first thing is... Maybe this. Bring it, in my opinion, bring it to where people usually start in their minds when you say the word soreness. And then there's typically the very, 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 very binary discussion of is it good or is it bad? And as soon as you even ask that question, a lot of people will say, what are you, stupid? Of course it's good. So right there we've got a problem. Because the general assumption with zero evidence that it's good and good for what and good for which person and good for what sport or good for endurance or good. Is it good at all? It is one of those traditional longer than any of us have ever been alive assumptions that will never die. No matter what someone proves. If someone proves that, yeah, you know, it's not really good, not bad, not good, and people will still be like, oh, it's good, I know it is, because we just love to have this little belief system in our head, and, you know, it doesn't bother me, I don't care. But the big thing is, um, I normally like to start this kind of stuff with, do you really think there's one kind of soreness? Is your experience with exercise and or clients so incredibly limited that you've only experienced one kind of soreness? Then you don't even have a platform to make a judgment from with a little belief system thing going on in your head. So I think that's maybe the place to start is can we bring a, a, a collectively between us some of our experiences, not just personally, because while that's important, experiences with clients through a vast continuum of tolerances and goals and needs and starting points. And that's really more important for someone calling themselves a professional. We've got to get out of the whole, well, I like, well, I think, well, I believe, because you know what? It just doesn't matter. It's what is the client getting out of this thing or good or bad. So can we start with that? Can we start with, um, are there two kinds of soreness are there and typically you know charlie and i when we talk about this stuff anything anything we always recognize that if we if we could list five of something we've probably only scratched the surface and and you know i think that's incredibly important the more intelligent pe the people i've met um one of the biggest constants principles, themes among those people is they always question what they know. And no matter how dead how smart they are, they always assume they don't, they're not there yet. It's always the question of what am I missing? And we're always missing more than we think we know. So if Charlie and I were to play a game and Brandon were to throw in his experience with his clients and his own bodybuilding and whatever stages of exercise you've been in from 13 on, um, even maybe the day you started drumming, there was probably some version of soreness that was different from what you get in your biceps when you're 13, which is different than what you might feel today with the current way you train. So can we make a list of those, Brandon? You're in charge of the, the virtual whiteboard of lists. I got a virtual so Charlie, book. What, book. Do you, what do you think, Charlie? <clears throat> well, this goes back to, you know, a, a discussion you know, in 2002, 
when you were elaborating on the um, functional training type of, of approach to um, talking about exercise at RTS. And one of the things that, um, you know, of the billion things that stick in my head uh, that you taught slash guided people through was this idea that one of the criticisms that was launched at you most of the time when you would dive into some of these subject areas was that you were just being too semantic about it or you were just talking about semantic argument. The irony of that is that, um, you know, as I've <clears throat> hopefully grown, developed and maybe gotten a little less dumb, I think that <clears throat> we have to start off with the words and what they mean and when we talk about soreness, um, oftentimes I think we fail to, re we think of it as this objective thing when in reality it, it describes a subjective phenomenon that can only really be experienced by the person who is using that particular noun or adjective depending upon um, how they're describing the situation. And that is not to say as you so wisely taught me all those years ago that that subjective um, information is bad. Subjective information is actually very valuable, but I think we have to realize that the individual nature of the subjective information is what underlies the meaning behind words like soreness. And so people think of it as kind of a monolithic thing. It's this soreness thing that happens to me and everybody if they're unaccustomed to exercise um, and they do something or they're accustomed to a certain amount and they go excessively on volume that they're not accustomed to um, or just a sensory feeling. Uh, one of the, in the article that I, I think it was the article that I sent you guys earlier um, and for the people that are watching, it was a study that I was involved in with GlaxoSmithKline. They were testing a drug back in, I think it was 2015. Um, and they measured soreness, the type of soreness that was elicited um, after exercise-induced muscle damage. Their version of it was only the type of soreness that the person would experience when they were touched. So... It was this, we used this thing called the visual analog scale and the person had to mark where on the, um, they were in terms of this feeling, but it was when you would touch the tissue. It wasn't just when they were standing there. Well, that's a completely different type of experience for somebody. Or if they were contracting, or if they were lengthening, or if, and, and I assume they at least measured the exact place as well as the exact amount of touch. Well, or did they just go boing boing? I, yeah, it was a much more of a boing boing thing. <laughs> That's so sad. And we're calling that research. <laughs> well, yeah. So there's a variable. And was, isn't it kind of important to identify and control as many variables as possible? And that's a pretty easy one, right? How hard are we pushing? I mean, if you get a nail gun and touch somebody with it, it's a little different than just, you know, your a, a piece of paper folded. and Yeah. Yeah. And I, I do believe that the uh, when the, the also the problem with that was there was a range of motion assessment that was going on too. So in these studies where they're looking at exercise induced muscle damage, or at least in this particular one that I was involved in, um, they combined what they called the FANG, which is the flexed angle, and the um, extended angle, which is the hang, I think. Um, and the they were looking at after inducing this damage through eccentric contractions, did the overall range change? Now, in order to identify that, you had to measure both the flex armed angle and the extended armed angle. Um, but that was also done, I believe, if I can remember the protocol, it was done prior to the visual analog scale for the subjective sensation of soreness. So you've got that leading up to it too, right? The fact that the, the person had their arms straight and then bent all the way prior to, you know, checking to see whether it was sore. So there's a bunch of stuff that's happening before it as well. Plus they're doing an MVC before that, et cetera, et cetera. So 
any of the inputs into the system that are going to change the sensory profile of what the person is experiencing will have an effect one way or another on their sensation of soreness. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's pretty much a mess. Um, and, you know, it, it's a valuable piece of information and we can take these things and try to, um, you know, make them more granular and, and, and sensitive. Um, but sometimes we have to recognize that when we get into describing experiences, they oftentimes cannot be um, narrowed down that far. On that Can note, I, yeah, go ahead. Tom, go ahead. I was going to ask, I mean, Charlie, in, in that world, in the research world specifically, I mean, when you have that such broad scale of subjective interpretation of how something feels and they're trying to quantify that so they can create a study. I mean, do they have, I mean, and I don't know, I'm pardon me if this is a dumb question, but do they have some parameters to help guide the subjective <clears throat> soreness and make sure that there's relative consistency amongst the whole thing? Well, I don't, they're, they're, uh, in a study like a drug study like this, I mean, they have, there's a bunch of research that has led to the hypothesis that they're testing anyway, especially when, when they've got this drug that they're spending, I don't know, two and a half million dollars on a particular study, phase one trial, to just to see whether, you know, they can move on with it or not, which, by the way, I, I don't believe it did. Um, I, think, I think that it didn't show that this particular drug, which was created for muscular dystrophy, um, or where they wanted to see whether it might have a protective effect in terms of muscular dystrophy um, and aging to some extent. Uh, there was a bunch of stuff that led up to it where they used soreness as one of the indicators and they were trying to see whether it was changed. So uh, we had talked about this kind of in, in, in meeting up before this particular podcast where this guy, Kaznori Nosaka, Ken Nosaka, and uh, a woman, Patricia Clarkson, they um, established that there was a decrement in force production in terms of a maximal voluntary contraction, isometric contraction at 90 degrees um, of 40% or greater that was indicative of muscle damaging, damage having occurred through exercise. And they associate, there was an association created between creatine kinase levels in the bloodstream, okay, which are indicators of the inflammatory markers of muscle damage, and this decrement in force production. And so one of the other associative variables is soreness. So they're looking at it from the perspective of, is the, the soreness seems to be present, is that changing as well? So not testing that so much. It's a dependent variable, but it's not, it's not, you know, it's, it's not the thing that they're really specifically looking at. I don't know whether that answers your question. Um, it's an association um, that has been established. And then what you typically see is you typically see a change that's associated between a return in terms of the force production with a return in terms of range of motion and a decrease in creatine kinase levels, as well as um, a decrease in, in pain from muscle soreness. That's super interesting. No, super interesting. And so super all interesting the things that, that go along with yeah. getting rid of inflammation. Correct. <laughs> or, or, or what we might just call damage. Right. So this, if we bring it back for a second to <clears throat> this spectrum of soreness where everybody doing too much too soon. And I know, you know, 15 things pop in my head. Number one, everybody thinks, well, when you first start, or when a client starts, you're just going to be sore. No, that you did too much, too much range, too little control, i.e. too, too rapid deceleration, uh, there, uh, too much volume, too much weight, a whole bunch of stuff that most people just think, well, here's where you start. Here's the protocol for starting someone even, and most people's assessments are so poorly are too far down the road for your average real person starting exercise. The assessments already cause soreness. So where I want to go is go back and go, let's identify some things because usually that kind of soreness, you know, back in the, I don't know when, decades ago, they came out with everybody loves acronyms, DOMS. It's like, oh, DOMS, do you have DOMS? I got DOMS. It's like, okay, can you just say the whole dadgum thing? Are you really that bad at speaking? You can't say delayed onset muscle soreness because, you know, you sound smarter. So people, this, this is the most common one, and it's usually, it's the one people talk about, seems to me, as soreness, if they were going to collectively talk about it. And 
Usually it's at a musculotendinous junction. And seems like if someone actually tries to lengthen, you, they're like, wow, and certainly you could touch it, and it's wow. And it may radiate from the musculotendinous junction, but become less severe as it goes out. Very rarely is someone's chest sore in here. It's usually more so and less so and yada, yada, yada. And if I'm not, if I'm misrepresenting your experiences with that end of the spectrum, throw throw in your piece of the puzzle. But um, so then we could go to the other end that I'm not sure many people have experienced, <clears throat> but I'm going to describe it as best I can. And it is associated again with a specific way of training that is not normal. It is highly controlled. It is very intention based. It is controlling the contraction above and beyond what's required by the weight alone. It's dramatically controlling deceleration and, and acceleration, although that may not have the same effect on soreness. <clears throat> but by doing this attempt at filling up the muscle thing and controlling every drop of the range, it seems like when someone beats the crap out of themselves doing it that way, as long as they don't go beyond, well, we'll save that, that very often you can create a, a type of soreness that is very diffuse and not necessarily any worse or, or, or lesser in any single part of the muscle. And very often you have to actually work hard to identify it like a really tight contraction or a really long lengthening and go, oh, wow, there's something there. And by the next day, it's very often gone. And I, if we equate this to my analogy that some guys in England love to steal of the sunburn thing where, um, you know, you can go out in the sun for the first time and whatever, depending upon your skin situation, and you might get a little, little bitty tiny kind of pink and by the next morning it's gone away. That was how I would equate this versus going out and get a third degree burn, which is truly an injury, which is what I would, how I would classify by analogy the delayed onset muscle soreness. A couple more things. While I don't perceive, when someone says, is it okay to be sore? My brain immediately goes to those two ends of the spectrum and, and, and the giant, vast, infinite things that could coexist in between there. You with me? Um, between those two extremes. And I guess, honestly, that's an extreme of actual soreness existing. I guess the actual continuum at one end should be there is none. But let's, <laughs> let's stick to the... Uh, I do feel something spectrum <clears throat> one time. And I, I hate when I do this, somebody tells me something <clears throat> and I'm going, wow, that's interesting. I got to find out more. And then by the time I finish talking with them four hours later, it's like, I forget it until I'm a year later, but I was sitting one time with, uh, uh, Dr. Con Scott Conley, who was the metrics guy. If you've been alive long enough, you would remember metrics being a big deal when he owned it before somebody else ruined it. Um, <clears throat> he was sitting there talking in his incredibly bland, boring voice uh, while being an incredible, incredibly fun guy to listen to. Um, he wasn't quite the, uh, there wasn't a lot of inflection. So <clears throat> he said, well, they've proven that soreness is good because they took a bunch of weightlifters <clears throat> that got sore and did biopsies, ouch, and found micro tears and he automatically associated micro tears with good. And I'm not going to argue with him. But the thing of I immediately thought of a couple of things. Number one, I've never heard of anything tearing even at a microscopic level that wasn't just a bunch of random collagen laid down unless you did something very specific to influence its repair. It's certainly not contractile tissue automatically that's laid down. So I would not perceive that as a good thing. And the other thing is, who said that what they did in terms of a workout – and what they felt and what they found with biopsy, who said those were productive things just because a bunch of big guys or strong guys got them? What we don't know is there is no comparison of, well, we took a bunch of guys that didn't do that. We took a bunch of guys that did do that and got torn up. And the guys that got torn up and had delayed onset muscle soreness, oh, my God, they got so much stronger, so much faster. There was no comparison of anything. It was just they had it. So it's like. That's like saying, well, you've got COVID. It must be good. I mean, we're not comparing it to whether you die or not. It's just you have it in your – I mean, that's a dumb analogy. But you see what I'm saying? There was no – I don't even know how he could – anyway. That's the kind of stuff we run into. So, it, you know, and that falls into the tradition category of you got to tear it. you got to break it down to build it up. It's like, what? Come on. 
really? How do you know that? Just because coaches have always made people do that, it doesn't mean it's the way. Just because people with the awesome genetics have gotten huge doing that doesn't mean you're going to. And the question is, did they ever try making progress without that extreme? Have they ever done a control Tom. on themselves even? Even and it's gonna it's gonna lean towards anecdotal, but I was reading about anecdotal versus empirical, and really empirical is a giant continuum also, where even if you're doing some controlled variables, somewhat detailed observation, you can still do self-empirical. You don't have to be in a lab to do it. But the problem is people they, they, their observation ability sucks. They they don't know they've manipulated fifteen things at once because they don't understand the variables in exercise or life. So anyway, there's a there's some stuff that I think is interesting to talk about a, in terms of is soreness good or bad? What type are you talking about? And maybe maybe the one on the end of the continuum that's just barely there and is very different. Is it good physiologically? Is it just good for feedback? Wow, I did something. Is it good for what? Is it good or is it bad for what? Is it bad because you can't straighten your arm or is it bad because you couldn't have sex because your abs were sore. I don't know what bad means either. Well, I think one of the things about subjective information is it has to start in terms of trying to place um, any kind of a judgment on it. We have to start off with what is the value system of the person that is experienced in it? For instance, well, if somebody thinks that it's an indicator that they've worked hard, so to speak, that they've put in effort that might be different than the person that I deal with, with chronic disease, where anything that's sore, they're going to, so they all, this isn't true of all people with chronic disease, obviously, but for a lot of the the populations that I'm dealing with, if they have, if they experience soreness in some way, that is a put off to the exercise because they might associate that with some version of soreness that they've subjectively experienced previously relative to their condition. Well, I would argue that any real person, that's a deterrent to exercise anyway. There are people that have never exercised in their life, and they know if they go to the gym, they're going to get sore because that's just what people know about going to the gym, even if they've never done it. So I would argue that for real people who actually need exercise the most to to help with diabetes, to help with heart disease, to help with the things that exercise was is really most important for in terms of the, the, the greatest number of people, it's a deterrent for sure. And even if even if it's the other guy who thinks it's good, that doesn't make it good. No, but it's important to understand how they place value on it so that you can have that conversation, because then if they have an expectation, I mean, you know, uh, if there was one person that taught me about expectations and goals, it was you. But if they have the expectation that that is supposed to happen, (laughs) right, then you might have have that conversation. It's an uphill battle that that we have no business having because it's like talking about a religion with them. It's not talking science, you know, but it's a problem because like culturally, it's just kind of a normal thing. Like, you know that, Hey, if I'm going to play a musical instrument, I've played guitar for two hours today. It's my first time. My hand's going to be sore. Well, I've never done this before. And people just associate a new thing with soreness. And that's just a common adaptation to mean X, Y, and Z. So like, it's kind of just so colloquial that we have to figure out how we're going to like how to have that conversation, which I think is great to dive deeper in. I love what you just said. And, and exercise people don't like analogies that are outside of exercise because they go, that's not what we're talking about. It's like, wait a minute. Think outside of this microcosm and you might learn something about principles and there might be something to apply here. And I think that's a great one because if you're just starting, your goal is really motor learning. You're really in skill acquisition mode and you don't. And skill acquisition really kind of needs some frequency of addressing it. Would you agree? It's kind of good to be able to try to acquire more skill every day, maybe. Um, And if you do something that makes it so you can't do it the next day or the next day or the next day. And so you basically have have ruined your current short term opportunity to improve skill. Right. If you're smart, oh, I'm going to work through it. Okay, well, that's it's like cutting my arm and it starts to heal a little bit. I'm I'm going to, yeah, it's just stupid. It's stupid. But so the Bill Parcells quote, the Bill Parcells quote that I I didn't realize it was a guy I was watching Richard Jefferson on, on um, an NBA game. And he didn't mention that it was Bill Parcells, but he said it back in the day, which is the greatest ability is availability. 
right? And that is literally the foundation of the study that you helped me with with the Lyme disease patients, which I'm now taking the same design and using it with proton treatment patients with prostate cancer, which is what we want to do is make sure that we don't do anything that is going to get in the way or interrupt their participation in exercise. So if anything is a possible deterrent, we would want to avoid it at all costs. And in the case of the motor learning scenario, if your soreness is actually preventing your participation because it's extreme and it hurts too much, or because now you're less nimble, coordinated, whatever, because you're simply not able to do it as well when you're sore, that's a problem. So I think that this is kind of the lost side of the conversation that nobody really wants that, or they, they don't seem to want to ever have, which is, what could be better than always being available to exercise? And if anything gets in the way of that, it's probably an issue for you. And especially if you have a goal, if you're trying to be Mr. Olympia, the regularity with which you participate seems to be pretty important. Now they're probably not even going to get sore. That's one of the things I found later in bodybuilding was it was virtually impossible to make myself sore, which I was depressed about because one thing I think we should bring up about all three of us, every one of us probably still is a closet soreness aficionado, right? Like I still like getting a little, I don't want to be for lots of reasons so sore that I can't do something. Life, right? Soreness is non-functional. You could even say because if you can't participate in real life, that blows function, so to speak. But I love just that little tiny bit the next morning that I can't even feel by 10, but at six o'clock in the morning, it's like, wow, that was pretty good. And then I forget it's even there. I still love that. That's my leftovers from bodybuilding or, 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 or drive, you know, something still in me thinks it's good. And if it's my thing is, is it, I certainly don't, I don't mind if it's not good. I just don't want it to be negative. And that's another thing people have trouble with is the difference between good, not good, and bad. Something can be not good and also not bad. You know, it's kind of neutral. It's like water in the pH scale. So, um, and again, because people are so binary. So you're saying it's not good, so it's bad, right? It's like, oh my God, I can't converse with these people. Their, their view of the world is so limited. And I'm sure we already lost everybody, like 99% of the world with our conversation thus far because they wanted to know if it was good or bad. Well, the conversation is also interesting because there's immediate, you would not necessarily like it if you were doing, if you hadn't trained your chest in a week and you then go and do some sort of leg extension thing and, and a, a, leg, a leg workout and you experience soreness in your pack. That's not necessarily something that you're going to like that next morning, that little bit of soreness. So there's an experience that is built based on your experiences that is greater than just the sensory feeling. There's, there's, there's a grouping of things that are associated to this word, soreness, that have to be there for it to elicit that positive, a little bit of that's good. Like, yeah, I just did, I just trained that tissue yesterday or two days ago. But if you didn't just train that tissue two days ago, which is the issue that I'm talking about with some of the chronic disease people, right? They get sore in their calf and we haven't done anything for their lower body in a week. So you start thinking thromboembolism. <laughs> you see what? Yeah. yeah. Like that. Yeah. It's only if these associations match a previous experience, which didn't have a net negative outcome for you. That's brilliant. You're getting into some, really deep, some really deep mindset stuff there and the framing for individuals, because I mean, the number of people in Canada right now, it's been terrible weather. Canada sucks. We've got all these people who've been cooped up because of COVID and lockdowns. Weather's getting a little bit nice. People are starting to go out for walks. And I got a group of people between the age of 55 and 65 that never have any injuries. And in the last few months, they're going out for longer walks because they got the Fitbit. They're trying to do the 10,000 steps. One's got bursitis. And yeah, God forbid we start with 100 steps, right? <laughs> right. No, no. But this is the thing. It's like, this. It's like, and we've talked about this with the 
the 5K run thing. Like, I'm just going to go run a 5K. There's clearly no progression there, but people don't connect. I mean, if you do a level of activity, they expect there's going to be some adaptation soreness that's just normal for getting back to it. And then they get the soreness in the knee, like the bursitis or the plantar fasciitis and whatever you want to call it, like the other end, the not good side of the soreness. And then you've got these two sorenesses where it's I've got the sore muscle belly. I don't like how this feels. And then the sore joint that, well, this just must be a part of it. And so what do they do? They keep going and they it's tough because that's just it's just common and like juggling pains versus the sensation in my muscle is a really big thing. I mean, I'd love to ask both of you guys how you handle that, like from a pragmatic perspective with clients and Charlie with you with studies, because there's kind of two juggling of people. You've got like material problems of aging demographics and then the juggling of how they're managing the sensations of exercise, whether they like it or not, and if that soreness is valuable. Like so. How do you guys juggle the two of those things? It's really easy. If you change your mindset, it's really easy. And what I mean by that is I'm not saying it's easy for everybody. Most trainers are so looking for what's the answer. How much do I do? As soon as they start wanting numbers, I know they need to go away or get a new brain because numbers don't tell you what's going to make somebody sore or not. Only, and Charlie mentioned the subjective earlier, <clears throat> the information I need to train someone is on the inside of them and they can't necessarily immediately interpret their own internal experience. That to me becomes a skill interpreting what's going on inside of yourself, not only being able to communicate it, but being able to clarify to some degree. And I demand that of all my patients and clients because they have all the information I've gotten kind of sort of half-assed good at seeing some things from the outside because I watch even the slightest thing on their face and I go, what's up? Give me some information. What's up? Well, it kind of feels funny. Wait, what does feeling funny mean? You know, so there's a lot of stuff there. But the, I have a general rule. First of all, let me, let me qualify this general rule. I have absolutely no problem actually thoroughly enjoy beating the living shit out of somebody in exercise. But they've got to jump through some hoops to get there. Everything's got to be firing on every cylinder. They have to have progressed to that level of volume, load, control, everything. If anything gets tossed, thrown, sped up, done, the last rep better be better than the first rep. Those are my rules. And if that's the case and you can do it, man, I'll take you to where you just don't want to be. And quite frankly, that's harder to do with people that are big and strong and have worked out forever because they can't get back in a point of control because they're so dead set on just moving that crap at all costs. So, but the big thing is if they, I tell them, despite the fact that I love doing that for the people that are ready and deserve and need and part of their goal and subjective desires, you're supposed to never get sore in my world if you're a patient or a real person for lots of reasons. They're not good yet at distinguishing soreness. To your perfect point, they don't know the difference between calf sore, Achilles tendon sore, plantar fasciitis sore, they don't. And it once, it, once you get two or three of those, it's just big, giant, fat sore. They can't delineate for a long time and, until things start, oh, this one falls off and this one falls off and I got a spike in the bottom of my heel. So that's a mess. So my, and it's easy. You just have to, you brought up um, something we all learned. While you were gone, something happened, you didn't work out for two weeks. One week's usually not bad, two weeks. God, I'm gonna be sore. Why? Why on earth would you go back in and do the exact same stuff you did before? I love after I uh, imposed layoff because I know the first time back is going to be a really great workout because I only got to do a set of something just to start making things wake up again and getting a little more tolerance, which seems to be as much the nervous system and the uh, it's not necessarily just tissue, right? So... It's great because I'm like, well, the first one, I can just go in and just kind of do some mediumish weights and practice the, the, the motor skills and practice squeezing. And um, next time I'll ramp it up and next time I'll ramp it up. And then in like a couple of workouts, you're back to where you were. The dumb thing is going in with any expectation of doing the same numbers. In fact, on a given day, the numbers may jack you up anyway because you came into it with no sleep or no eat or no food or no blah, blah, blah. So it's just not hard. We just kind of have to be smart. And we're just so bad at that in the exercise world. And I got to tell you, sucks at it the most. And this is a giant generalization. The higher the level of degree most people attain in exercise, and certainly their professors, they suck at all this stuff because they have limited, incredibly limited 
personal experience, exercise experience, client experience. They think everything is learned from a piece of paper, or a textbook. They come out of school and have no idea how to work with someone. They're doing for, for a 60 year old lady wanting to lose weight. They're trying to do power cleans. They have no idea how to progress, how to even assess. And one of the cool things that I was thinking about when Charlie was talking was if we were doing a proper assessment, which is watching how well they're motor learning and slowly taking that motor learning ability out for a ride, let's try a little more weight. Let's try a little more speed. Well, you lost it there. Did you notice you lost it there? So can you fix that or do we have to back up? It's not just, there's no, you know, oh, do we have to go back and wait? I don't know that you do. Maybe you can focus more and we can fix this. Maybe you don't do as much volume. Something I learned from a guy named John Bleibernick. If you go up in one thing, you might back off in some other things and then get good at that thing, and then you can bring everything else back up. But the point is, if everything you're doing that would prevent soreness because you're progressing right is exactly how we should be assessing people. And I prefer to call it investigation because assessment has this canned connotation to it. Which assessment? The assessment is watching them do what you want them to do. You're investigating their ability. And you don't need full range. You get to work up to that. And you don't need the weight that makes you tired today. You don't even need to get tired today. You can work up to that. Why in the world is everything you have to sweat and get tired and lift a PR your first day in the gym? What the? We don't get exercise. We don't get training people. We do what we like to do. And, the, and that came from some idiot we learned from 50 years ago. It's all really easy if we sit back and go, what makes the most sense? The thing, remember, Charlie, we used to talk about least amount of unaccustomed activity. I've amended that. That's 50 percent of the story. This idea of micro progression and how much is enough, the least amount of unaccustomed challenge or activity. So if someone comes in the first day. How much did you exercise yesterday, week before and last year? None. Well, pretty much anything is going to be enough for today. Let's keep it small. One comes before 10. Right. The other thing is. There's some leeway there. The least amount of unaccustomed versus what's tolerated. And when I say tolerated, not just did you survive it, but what's tolerated without any version of repercussions. There's a window in there. So you might have somebody walk in and go, man, I'm afraid this is going to backfire. I'm going to I'm just going to go so slow. I don't want to feel anything the next day. Maybe it's more of a patient. Maybe it's the chronic disease person because it can blow up in your face so bad, so fast with what you think is nothing. But at the same time, you get a kid coming in, assuming that kid's pretty good at control, which is rare. They might have a tolerance that's greater than just the least amount of what they're accustomed to. And that window can be fun because they in that first workout, they can be like, man, you're really good at controlling your body and you're good at listening and you're good at reproducing what I'm, 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 I'm trying to ask from you. Let's, let's today even, let's just go up a little bit. And, and for them talking about the expectations of the person, that's, that's, well, they came to, they want to do weight anyway. So you're, you're, you're giving them a notch of that. So again, least amount of unaccustomed versus the most reasonably tolerated with no repercussions at all. None. Well, speaking of least accustomed activity, there's a nice echo. Charlie, you got something special there. I saw some colorful circles, and I think that might be No, it's just uh, Tom was talking about um, the information inside of them. And so one of the things that Tom helped me with uh, years ago, we were try I was trying to figure out how to control the um, resistance to not send somebody the over the edge, somebody with uh, mild, moderately symptomatic Lyme disease, people who are highly reactive to um, stress in the exercise sense. And, 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 you know, Tom kind of was the first person to say like, Oh, you got to stop thinking about torque. This is ridiculous. Like you got it. You got to, he wasn't calling me ridiculous. He was saying what you need to do is you need, you need to, you know, we need, we need to create a scale. Um, an RPE. And then we went through how the RPE sucked and all that other stuff that were out there because they were too coarse. The term coarse being that the, um, the, sorry, they were too fine that the range between each level of the RPEs is too small. So if you're asking somebody on a 10 point scale, are you a one or a two people are left with, huh? <coughs> I can't really discern the difference. And so um, Tom and I came up with a five-point scale. Now, 
the reason why I'm bringing this up now, it's still backwards when I do this. The reason I'm bringing up th this now is because Tom said sometimes you need to give them a script to be able to tell you what's going ins on inside them. In other words, they don't, they may not even have the language to be able to express that to you. So things like RPEs are helpful, at least in that way. So if you're judging, and my problem with assessments is similar to Tom's, my extra problem with it is we feel like as humans, we need to judge everything constantly as opposed to just taking inventory of something. So I feel like the term investigation is a really good term to use because I feel like that's more of this. I'm, I'm, I'm observing and taking notice and, and gaining information. And while you're doing this thing, Right. And I'm reserving judgment on it until I have to make a decision about it. Right. And I think that's the problem is we get mixed up and think that that the assessment has to all be about judgment. And I think that's where assessment goes off the rails in talking about dosage. OK, the, uh, my whole dissertation revolves around the subject of resistance training dosage. And the problem with talking about dosage is oftentimes what you encounter are these terms like intensity in percentages of one repetition max, for instance, <laughs> okay? So it's like, first of all, out the window, the idea of, of titrating dosage, right? Which is perhaps starting with the least amount and figuring out on that day or in that week or in that series of exercises, what is tolerable and, and what their experience is and building up upon that, that's that, doesn't exist in exercise, right? And I think that one of the things that is interesting that, that Tom taught me a long time ago, which was microprogression isn't just an idea that is from workout to workout. See, I when I first learned microprogression from Tom, I, I kind of, in my head, I had the idea of progression in the sense that I feel like most exercise professionals have it, which is we're going to progress from workout to workout. So the idea of progression is from one workout to the next workout. It's actually within the workout. It's, it's within, and it perhaps is within the rep. And, and, and the reality of it is, is that in my mind, and I may be wrong on this, the biggest problem with this is we simply move too quickly to do anything meaningful in terms of really understanding and observing the variables that are available to be progressed and micro progressed, which is what the failure is to me. It, and it, our mindset is too fast in terms of what we're expecting out of people. It's too fast in terms of how quickly we want to go up in certain things. It's too fast in terms of how, how, what the tempo of the rep is. It's everything that we do, right? We do an assessment. And as, again, going back to Tom, is that the assessment or the version of investigation is every single repetition in every single exercise. I mean, if there, there are some classic things that, that, that I just will, I will never let go that Tom has taught that I've never heard anybody else say them. Well, I've heard other people try to steal them, but I've never heard anybody else. I know they didn't come from that person. Um, besides Tom, explain these things in a way that made sense and was and were actionable. Immediately actionable in terms of these particular concepts. The, 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 this, this PEX scale, um, this five-point scale that, that we designed, has been highly effective at allowing, and I'll, I'll talk about that Tom was talking about kind of this window above the least amount of a custom activity. And what I would suggest is there's even a window between what they did before and the least amount of unaccustomed activity. What there's do you mean? Actually, in other words, instead of thinking of progression in terms of you're you're explaining that this window exists between the least amount of an, of unaccustomed activity and perhaps larger than that in terms of tolerance. What can be tolerated, right? What I'm suggesting is what they did before. There's a there's 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 even space between that and the least amount of unaccustomed activity. 
Well, which is where there, I spend all my time. version of tolerance. Right. It's on the other side, though. Yeah. 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 So because of because they did do something, you've got you, you get to go a, a, a notch or two beyond the least amount. That's always the guess. Right. Or you might even be, do- what I'm suggesting is you might be doing the same thing. Their progression might be just in the fact that they're doing two of the same workouts. Because mm-hmm. it's twice the volume as before. See, people think of progression as some sort of increase in all the variables, but oftentimes they're not thinking of, well, if I do the same amount of whatever on this exercise twice, two days, that's that's double. That's two that's two that's having twice done it versus once done it. <clears throat> yep. But that's so, all that's that's when the least amount covers every possible and I'm not saying Listen, I'm always guessing at what the least amount is. And and so many factors like, is it going to bore them? But it's the this giant stew of time and speed and all this crap. So it's really, it takes a really someone has to know all these variables in order to even pretend to identify them and to then to know how to manipulate them is yet a, a, another thing. It's one thing to read the spices on the shelf at the store. It's another thing to be a master chef. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a mess. Uh, one fun thing that I remembered we were driving in your car, we just about came up with that bulk of that scale in your car from the airport before we even got to where we were going to do some work. But it was funny because I, may, I was making fun. I was talking, I was just reviewing for, us the crap from what then was a super rough draft chapter in the manual and i i kind of under effort i had this thing called conversational lifting where i was making fun of actually people that go oh yeah and they got their dumbbells they're going yeah i want to get my hair done tomorrow i think i'll get it red and am i done yet have i done 10 those kind of people and i used to make fun of that and then as we're driving and you're taught you're telling me the challenges because there apparently could be benefits to exercise, but these people, man, there's just issues. Um, it became obvious that there's two benefits from conversational lifting, right? For them. I have a question yeah. I want to throw out there. Sorry. Sorry. Pardon me. No, it's, and I don't mean to change. I don't want to change direction, but it's kind of in the same vein because Charlie, you're talking about speed and then we're talking about managing expectations. And we're also talking about everything before pre like at the lowest level of a custom activity. Well, I want to ask you guys this because I mean, in, in this town, I, I am one of the guys for people who want to feel better. I mean, I charge three times as much as everybody else. I've got a good business. Our entire gym is known exactly for that. And I want to throw this out there that, and I want to know if I'm missing something. I really feel like that that low level, like pragmatically speaking, like trying to get someone to embark on this journey of exercise. All of my clients have been foobarred, like messed up one way or another in a previous experience before getting to me, which gave them the the mindset and paradigm shift shift change to allow them to be opened to that low 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 intensity and progression model and i am thinking about all my clients like everyone is someone that has done something they've had a big problem they went too far they tried to follow the traditional rules and because they trolled those rules they ended up having problems and now they're here with me which opened up the doorway to even have that low level progression everyone from 45 year old hockey guys to 85 year olds so i'm just wondering if you guys would be open to speaking like about your personal experience, like do you have people who come in who have not had serious problems beforehand, not chronic conditions, not aches and pains beforehand that you can get them on board with this very intellectual, intellectual, strategic, slow, but smart methodical progression model. Yeah. First, one of the things I want to say, if, if I may, um, they, they just struck me right there at the end. So many times when people hear us talking the way we talk, there's the assumption that this is how we would talk to a client. Um, that just kind of struck me when you said intellectual, blah, 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 with a client. Man, I talk as basic and as simple. When you're teaching someone, you have to speak their language, right? Not my language. I'm not trying to I, – I get irked when a trainer uses the word abduction with a client because it's like that is not a word they'd say unless their kid got kidnapped, I mean, you know, the movie Abduction. That was supposed to be funny. Mel Gibson, Rene Russo. All right. Sorry. That's a movie. So, 
Before your time, yes, it was 10 years ago. So <laughs> it was in the 90s, so it was before your time. But anyway, um, that's an interesting thing. That's an aside. But Charlie, um, well, number one, I think it's the best way to build a business, a real business. If you're doing boot camps, and you, someone could probably apply this to boot camps. They could say, all right, you need to tell me what you're feeling, or better yet, you need to get a da-da-da, and we're going to do this much, and then this much, and this much, as opposed to the first day you're going to beat yourself up. But anyway, um, whether someone's beat up or not, there is an age of hopefully a little bit of wisdom, a little bit of I want to feel good because I don't feel as good as I did before, be it 40-year-olds or 80-year-olds. And Charlie said they want to leave feeling good. You said they want to leave feeling good. And, they, and that includes every workout, to be feel invigorated even. It is, and by the way, who's got the most money to throw at this thing? And who's going to be the, the most religiously participating client, meaning, meaning, man, they hate to miss. And they're going to be here for the rest of their life because their goal for this is their life. It's not the prom. It's not the high school reunion. It's not, wow, I hope I can power clean something today. These people are actually doing it for the real reasons, right? So this progression idea, and you realize this started out with soreness, but it all blends together because we're trying to keep them from being sore while getting them to make considerable progress, which is just easy if someone knows what they're doing. But um, it's a huge business opportunity. It's the biggest demographic out there that can't participate and have a really bad taste in their mouth People go, oh, I know, I know 70-year-olds that run marathons. Okay, and you're telling me that's not the exception? What's the rule? I want the people that are the rule. I want all these people that can't because I'm going to take them and only work within what they can. We'll kind of nudge that can towards the can't, if that makes any sense. I think what you're doing, well, it's going to be, it's always going to be unique in the industry and in the business of the industry. And that's so sad. Because there's only so many people you can see. But I'll tell you, you can advertise what I just said, and you're still going to get flakes. Advertising typically brings flakes. The people who go, oh, I've had 30 trainers. I want to see how you do. I won't let them in the gym because I'm like, one of those guys should have helped you, man. I know I can't if they somebody didn't. But the big thing is word of mouth. When people go, yeah, I, so-and-so said they've been coming here for a year, and they just feel great. And I, I've always been hesitant or had bad experiences, so I yada, yada, yada. That's everything we're talking about bleeds over into business humongously, right? So I don't know if that's exactly where you were going with that, but um, it, it is. But that it's kind is of nothing sad. else than motivation. It, it is, but it's also kind of sad at the same point because I mean, we're demographically and psychographically, we're talking about people who you know they've been to the end, they've had the problem, and then they come in, they've got the resources, their problems are not going away, so that's a it's a logical person to have come into your world you know all that's great but the problem is we're still talking about like after someone gets jacked up they come in and everything you said before like th that is a great business model there are so few of us that can you know in a very calm very smooth way articulate an idea to have someone who's got a problem feel good like, that's great and there's i mean we're obviously products of that many people who are going to be listening to this but we're still missing out on those like those front end people. And I don't really necessarily want those people in my business. But how do you educate them? Because how do you get the 20? You don't. The, the, Dude, you don't educate people that don't want to be educated. See, that's codependent nonsense. For sure. But then that's also kind of like submitting to that everyone's going to get messed up before they start getting better. No, 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 no. Define messed up. Hello, it's McFly. Let's go back to that thing. Someone just gets older and their back hurts because they sit on their ass all day. And it doesn't hurt like shooting down their leg. Define messed up because every one of us, even mostly, and certainly including the people who have done nothing, by the time they're 40, feel messed up if they're paying attention. And it started 20 years ago. So the whole thing is, if you're thinking that they're on crutches when they come in, that's not what I'm talking about. No, right? No. I'm talking about the people who recognize they're at least insightful enough with their own eternal experience to go, I just don't feel like I used to. And I sure don't want to exercise because, man, that CrossFit thing or whatever. That's exactly it. So I th and I think it's really easy because, first of all, if someone likes to exercise, I'm probably not even interested in talking to them unless they have a reason, like you're saying. It's the people who don't that are willing. Those people are of interest to me. Now, that's actually would be considered by a marketing person to be a tough crowd. You kind of go, you want to sell a new car, you go to people who want to buy a new car. 
certainly education is that way. I'm cramming education down someone's throat is impossible. Um, they've got to have an open space. They have to have dug a hole for me to fill it in. So, but at the same time, I think there's a, there seems to be, certainly for our business, trainers in my place get full really fast. Their schedules do by word of mouth, and they're not jacked up people like spurting blood or losing a limb or even post-op anything. They just want to feel better, and they know they're headed the wrong direction. They are that insightful. And I cannot tell somebody they're going to feel that way. I cannot convince you that's such a used car salesman kind of way of doing it. And I don't know why anybody else should run their business. But I've been doing – I got a thing, some stupid email the other day from a guy, and it said, I own a facility for eight years, and I can help you improve your business. And I sent him back, and I said, well, contact me in about 28 more years and, and tell me if you still know how to run a facility because you'll have to do that to catch up to me, and the only problem is I'll still be 28 years ahead of you. So, you know, it's it's a very different way to run a facility. It's a very different thing to offer. And someone can't just start doing it and say they do it. They have to have a decade of experience themselves. So they can actually provide it at every turn in a customized way because it's really problem solving. It's really about problem solving. It's, it, it's taking what someone presents to you and listening and going, all right, let's, let's see if we can come up with something here. Try this and try that. It's never, okay, I know what to do. That's never how to address these kind of people, ever. One thing Charlie said that was important about this investigation idea and that it's every rep and every everything. I love the word investigation because it lends itself to the uh, cop, the police shows where they always talk. Well, we can't tell you reporter about this because it's an ongoing investigation. So when he was talking about you don't have to immediately make decisions about it. You don't have to judge it. It's an ongoing investigation. And typically we don't tell the press about that because we're in the middle of it. I would tell people when they're learning in class, what I'm like, listen, stop correcting every dadgum thing that goes on that you see. Micro observe, but then sit on it for a while and see what they put together themselves. Are they calculating? Are they trying? Shut up. And, and, and now if they're just all over the place, you know, we got to corral that. But that micro observation, getting good at observing, but then being triaged, triage what you spit out. What matters most now? Does that make sense? So there's there's some interesting things that I wrote down when we were talking about that, um, that stuff that, that could help people with the clients you're talking about. And to me, listen, I to me, the proving myself is a thing. Talk is cheap. Marketing's mostly lies out there in the world in general. So when someone comes to me, and I'm not saying anybody else do this, I just want to show you how confident I am that I can problem solve. I don't know the answers. I will work towards finding out some current ones and I know they won't be the same answers tomorrow because they won't be the same problems, right? But someone comes to me and goes, do you think you can help me? And I said, there's only one way to find out if we can even remotely take you the way you want to go, not the way I want to go. Because I'll help people with goals I think are stupid, but they're not my goals do the best we can to do it in a, in a decent way. But they'll come in and say, well, how much is it going to be? And I said, well, I'll see you for this week and I'll do it for free. And if at the end of the week, you don't see that we're going the right direction, then you go, you take off and we're good. If you think it's the right direction to go, you owe me for this week and it's going to be X hundred dollars after this. So I'm invested in it. They've got nothing to lose. They don't have to sit there in their minds and go, well, that first session was not worth X hundreds of dollars because we didn't do anything. But I need those sessions where it feels like nothing happens. Those are the most important ones because I know I get to do like what Charlie said and do this this jump, this nudge, this thing. I've identified some tolerance, right? I need those sessions that feel like nothing that, where there's no feedback to them that they got to work out. So I'll take those as my investment in this process, because I'm pretty dang sure I can make something happen. And I'm more apt to fire them before they fire me, because I don't need somebody that doesn't need me. That's just boring. They can go get their, what they want anywhere. Charlie, what do you think? Um, there's a couple of things, uh, and, and some of them, I think when you were the the progenitor um, 
or you hold provenance over something, I, I think it's hard to see sometimes the value in that thing. And it, it, I don't mean that as, as a criticism of Tom, um, although it may sound like that, but I, I think there's an awful lot of things that, um, that again, nobody has ever talked about before. And there are things that I learned with him way back in 2002, 2003, and, and, and continued to learn beyond that. Um, things like restraint to the plane, restraint in the plane, and, and intention-directed resistance. And um, there are tools that are so, people are just completely unaware of them in terms of all the things that can be manipulated in call them normal healthy subjects with no issues. The problem is having the exposure to that person to show them those ridiculously cool things. The problem is that if you don't have the reason for them to come see you in the first place, you're never going to be able to have that experience unless back in the day when I was, you know, in the nineties, when I'm working on the gym floor, you know, um, I could go up to somebody and say, Hey, let me show you something right now for the 500 times that I may have done that. Maybe two people would have hired me when you've got somebody with issues automatically coming to you. You can, you can put that in, but, but that's the reason that's driving you to the door. I think it's funny. I, 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 I was watching somebody, um, I, there's been this conversation about how exercise isn't medicine because the big push for the ACSM that exercises medicine and all this other stuff. And, and that, you know, trainers aren't doctors. And I, I totally understand the lines that are drawn between certain things. Some of them, um, you know, are arbitrary. Some of them are pretty obvious to see, but what, I, what I will say is that exercise literally comes out of medicine. It originates in that whether you're going back to Galen or you're going back to Hippocrates or whatever, I mean, you don't have to go back that far. You can go to the ancient, but that is where it comes from because back then, and even to this day, I would argue that aging is a chronic disease. Now there are people that argue with me about this. This is one of the big fundamental philosophical views that I have um, in terms of exercise. But if we look at aging as a chronic disease, then that's everybody is going, you know, Tom taught us all that was years ago, right? Maintenance is progress because everybody is going through some version of degradation. So how steep is that curve going to be? Or can you flatten it out almost completely? And the only way to do that is to progress, right? I mean, those conversations, teaching those in RTS all the time. I mean, thank goodness they stuck, you know, because that, that fundamentally they become life worldviews. But the reality of it is, is that, is that it's a great vehicle to have people coming to you when they have issues. I got a, a, an instant message on Facebook. I don't check it much anymore, but it was from a guy who went to um, the Tim Arndt's IEFC um, several years ago, and I did Tom's push-up experience. And he still said that he's doing it and uses it with, right? So I had the ability, I mean, obviously this triggered a bunch of stuff, right, in this person, that they're using it with their clients, that they're, right, just like reason why we did it in, in RTS2 back in the day, but, or RTS3, I think it was back, or way, way, way long ago, but, but the, the, the reality of that is that I had the forum to be able to actually express that stuff, right, because I was doing a lecture at a conference that was basically a mini RTS, and so if you don't have that, I, I'm, I, I kind of have to agree with Tom that you're kind of just be glad that you do have the people that are. Now, if you have exposure in a mainstream gym, if you're working a good life, I don't know if that place even still exists anymore or something like that, you probably can show somebody some really cool stuff. Hey, look what happens when you do this. Um, you know, co-contraction thing where you can provide additive resistance through the triceps contraction while you're doing this biceps curl. Like, you're going to see how cool that, right? You, and that could hook somebody very easily. But you have to have the market for that. And because of what we come out of, I mean, the, the, the elephant in the room is that both you and I came through MAT stuff. So we had people coming to us with problems. 
right? It was RTS that helped the people, but they got there because of word of mouth through that other thing, right? You couldn't get them anywhere unless you did exercise with them. I'm sorry. It just isn't going to work that way. You have to actually get them so that they can do exercise, resistance training, whatever you want to call it. But those vehicles are available to you and me. And, and that, that's kind of what we came out of, Tom, from physical therapy. And, and I remember back in the day, people would come into the to focus and they'd be like, oh, no, like Tom was the everybody – a lot of people didn't like him who were his patients because he was so strict about everything, but they knew he was the only person that they could go to. I mean, I heard that from people that were, you know, had been in, had been around. This is going back to even the old folks. So I, I, I'm kind of all over the place here, but what I'm saying is I do think for people that aren't us, that if they have a market, if they have availability to people where they can use concepts now realize that if you're talking about intention and all those really cool stuff that 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 all that really cool stuff that Tom taught us, they're already going to have to have been at a level of progression to be able to even think about doing that stuff, right? So it's yeah, really hard to wow stuff. somebody with that not stuff. That, that, yeah, yeah, it's not just stuff to throw at everybody to, to look cool, right? right? It's a tool. It, it's a tool, but you can do it at lesser degrees so that they get a sense of what cool could be. Yep, yep. I just don't think that at this stage, we're the people to talk about it, right? It'd be the people in those other avenues, right? So people in who have access to main memberships. And I hate to tell you, but those things, those places are dying. You know, boutique the, training right? centers are going through the roof. Main what are box boutique training centers? Right. Those big are. Big box gyms are dying. Big box gyms are dying, which is where. To me, those would be the places where a lot of people would be interested in having that. Now, I, I'm, you know, I don't know whether that makes any sense. Well, let me put a. Let me go back. I, I'm just. I'm not. I'm adding to what Charlie said. Uh, I don't. I'm not intending to pretend that he didn't already say this. <clears throat> I'm going to give some analogies, which people outside of exercise. I mean, I, that are outside of exercise. But listen, if you if your first car <clears throat> was Give me something that you think is a great car. I mean, it's just a great car. The ride, the everything. Give me a car. C8 Corvette. Give me, tell me. Huh? C8 Corvette. Okay, that's probably not the smoothest car in the world. Can we can we go somewhere in Germany and get a good car? Sure. I don't uh, know. Let's, Jenna, pretend, let's, let's pretend it's some Mercedes thing or something, okay? And if the car enthusiasts are, are not liking us right now. <laughs> huh? The car enthusiasts are like, these guys are idiots. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. The, the Corvettes I rode in were 19, uh, <laughs> 1970 Stingrays, so they weren't exactly built for uh, comfort. They look good. But, um, yeah, that one, the cool one. Yeah. Yeah, With yeah. the door handles you push down on instead of, yeah. And so, uh, 68, actually. But um, So if your first car you ever drove, maybe even rode in because your family could afford it, if your whole life you were in Mercedes Benz, some upper class of those, you would have no idea how good a car it is. Absolutely no idea. If you had been in clunkers, the water pump went bad every other week. If you had all this stuff, then you had a pretty good car, only it was like riding like you're in a big truck when it was not a big truck, whatever. And then you finally get a Mercedes, you'd be like, oh, my God. God, the ride in this thing, the smell of this thing, the sound. Oh, my God, it tells me where to go. It shit, it drives and stops for me. All I'm saying is that having something to compare to changes perception dramatically. It creates a scale in your head of true value in your own world. So people that come to you are like, oh, I heard you were good. And they have no experience with crud trainers or even what are outside of the world uh, in the world considered good trainers. If they come and they get an experience they can compare to, it's way more valuable because the, I we have some people that have never trained anywhere else. And then they finally go on some vacation and they try to go to a gym and they're like, oh, my God, I didn't know what I had. So without this comparison thing, it, first of all, if you have it, it's an easy sale. That's why I'm so willing to do it for free in the beginning, because I know if I listen to why they're there and I listen to what they've tried before. 
And if they truly want to get better, it's a piece of cake. I can do it. And the one thing they say that makes the biggest difference, they walk in the first day and they go, so what are we going to do? And I'm like, I don't have any idea. And they go, wait, I thought you were good. What do you mean you don't have any idea? And I'm like, well, whose workout do you want, the last guy or yours? I don't know what yours is yet. Well, and I think that you and I would both agree because um, I've, I've certainly heard, learned a lot from you, you know, just by relaying the information to me. But the the greatest amount of information in terms of being a good trainer that I have ever learned, obviously going through your courses but um, and teaching for you, but it, it is working with people that, that are, you know, hemiplegic, that are um, have have 16 screws in their shin then and you know or and can't walk or what those are the people that you learn how to work with everybody else with so the reality of it is is that i don't know that i would want it any other way and if, if people are watching this and they're looking at at me or obviously i'm not in the same category as tom but if you're looking at me and thinking okay well what's some insight that you can give go find somebody even if it's pro bono and find somebody that needs help and cannot do anything because the reality of it is that 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 those are the people that you learn the most from every single time and nothing can be and nothing can be planned ahead of time in, with those people and you can't you have no idea how many reps they can do Sometimes their neurological ability is so low that for them to even get a little anything is a wonder at max. It's just like, Gah! and there's two things about that that some people are going to watch and they're going to say. As a teacher for over 30 years, that's the first thing is like, what's somebody going to say in their head to counter what I'm saying? Because they probably reasonable thing to think. But number one, people are going to go, well, you're talking about physical therapy now. And no, we are not. The difference between a client and a patient is huge, and the, the difference is not physical ability or lack thereof. The difference is legal. So right now, and Canada is different, but I'm going to talk about a real country. Sorry, that was supposed to be a joke. <laughs> a, a country that's open, okay? We're not closed all the time, being afraid of a little virus, okay? Well, New York is. But... <laughs> um. Insurance is so crazy now that it takes about five and a half seconds and someone's out of what would have been physical therapy and they are nowhere down the road. Anybody that has any fi financial wherewithal will be out there looking for a solution with their stroke, with their amputation, with their <clears throat> whatever, with their anything orthopedic or neurological or whatever. And the person that helps them will have them forever, whether they get well or not. That is not a patient. That's a client. They have nowhere else to go. Physical therapy can't take them because they've run out of their prescription and they can't work without a prescription. They are looking for a phenomenal trainer who can think beyond training, typical training. And to Charlie's point, there's a quote that I had for a long time. You will never, ever, ever become a masterful trainer until you work with people that can't do anything that you first throw at them. And you got to say, well, I don't know. Or you got to go, all right, here's what they can't do. How can I get down to what they can do? What can they actually do? That's where I have to start. The training world, meaning training ourselves in the gym, training other people thinks you have to do what they can't do in order to get to do what they can't do. That's not even possible. You can't run faster than you can run in order to get to where you can run faster. So the whole thing here is, and someone will go, oh, yeah, you can do toe training. That's not you doing it. That's still you doing something you can't do. So the whole thing here is you got to find for these people that can't do anything, what can they actually somewhere down in this little tiny thing, what can they do? And I have found so very few people that the medical community would write off that I can't, so few people I can't help in some way. I've got people, they would say after a neurological injury, a spinal cord injury, you're going to get back everything you're going to get back within a year. Well, that's a self-fulfilling prophecy because who tries to work on it after a year? In fact, right now they barely work on it for two or three months. 
I've had people that, that had their injury nine years ago and haven't moved their toes, and we've got toe movement. I'm not saying they're playing pianos with their toes. I'm saying they're moving, and that's not supposed to happen. I've got a guy right now that was in a head-on collision on a motorcycle at 50 miles an hour, and every piece of his body has got, body's got metal in it, and he's got nerve damage in his toe extensors, plantar flexors, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I was like, man, I may have met my match here. They're moving. They're, they're, they've got something going on, and it's all from starting with what he can do, which was almost nothing. So my assessment had to go down to, oh, well, he can't move it, so I don't know what to do. No, but can you feel the tendon even popping up when he tries? Even any tension in the, in the tibialis anterior tendon, it's like, holy crap, there's something there. There's this little itty-bitty flicker, like the, you know, the guy under the avalanche and the, and, the, and, the, and the dog that saves him can at least smell him, you know? So it's like that. So maybe there's a chance here. And working within that, with every single thing he did was a one rep max because it took that much to get a flicker. And so you don't do 10 of them because it's a one. It's just not hard when we shift gears to working with what you can instead of what you can't. Finding people that have a reason to come. But he was exposed to physical therapy in the hospital. He had a physical therapist come to his house. They got him up in a walker. His quads didn't work. Nothing worked after being in a coma, dying twice, being in a rehab center, flat on his back for 12 weeks. And the first thing they do when they come down is having him sit up straight and get on a walker. Number one, I can't believe he didn't pass out because blood hadn't had to pump upward in forever. And they're expecting to have a mu some musculature that can support his weight. That physical therapist with those eight years of school should be in jail. So seven, seven, 1711, Francis Fuller, as for exercise of the body, which is the subject of this ensuing discourse, if people would not think so superficially of it, if they would but abstract the benefit got by it from but the means by which it is got, they would see it set a great value upon it. If some of the advantages accruing from exercise were to be procured by any one medicine, nothing in the world would be in more esteem than that medicine would be. That is, <laughs> that's 300 years ago. And that's why we couldn't understand it. <laughs> yes. But what's interesting about that is, and, and what this keeps coming down to is, is that exercise, in, in my experience, and what has, I'm sure this came from somebody else, exercise is not the best single thing for any one condition. But it is across the board effective in virtually every condition meaning yes it's not the best thing for, it's not it, it won't match a drug in terms of combating certain diseases right you might want to find out what the that, what the cause of the disease is and maybe there's a drug that's better but as for something that has pluripotent effects as they say exercise is one of the few things that does that and it's able to do that for uh, the, the the list of reasons why that occurs are crazy and they're almost innumerable. But what you're saying is not in any way supportive of the way some listeners or future listeners may be currently administering or imposing exercise. Because if their brand, if their entire vision is sports or CrossFit or even something ACSM would be happy with in its protocols, that doesn't mean that that exercise is right for, and I know you weren't insinuating that. I'm just trying to go to where these people are out there. It's like, oh, well, awesome. Well, I'm going to do Pilates must be great then because it's good for mechanical back pain. It can be way, way, way too much in terms of range, in terms of force, in terms of lots of things. There is no brand or type of exercise that is inherently good for everybody. But exercise has some value for everybody. The whole thing is figuring out what this person needs, and it doesn't have a name. It's not a bench press. You came around. That, that was good. You got back around there. Well, interestingly, um, if you and, – and having to do this deep dive into the history of machines that I've had to do, <laughs> the whole reason for the creation of machines across the board was – to try to get people engaged who couldn't do bodyweight stuff, that it was too much. 
They oh, and now the doctors are saying, well, you don't want to use the machines. You need to go use body weight. Someone that can't, you need to go do chin-ups and stuff. They haven't been able to do a chin-up ever once in their life, but that's what the doctors recommend. What are you doing? Like shaving now or something? Kicked. We got it. There we, there we go. I didn't Loose know you owned one of those. Yeah, it's been doing it. Sorry, Tom. I'm sorry about that. Mine was a violent <coughs> anyway. But yes, it was, it was, it was, they can't do these things. We have to figure out some way to reduce it down to what we need out of this because it's simply too much, which is interesting. And along the way, man, I want, I, you guys got to come back down sometime and see, I've modified, I went from just modifying equipment to completely cutting it apart and putting it back together so it's unrecognizable. And the resistance profiles I've made, I'm, where I'm going with this is the other benefit to exercise, even with somebody who can't, who can do body weight, when you actually get a profile that matches what the body can do, my God, the outcome, and I don't necessarily mean, oh, they're going to get bigger, because I don't know how big, what their window of getting big is, but the efficiency, you can't run around doing 10 hard sets of this specific exercise when the profile is thoroughly exhausting from start to finish and especially on the last rep where nothing is left on the table at any point in the range after a set like that, which by the way, most people can't do because it's so thoroughly taxing. Most people are used to resting through the bulk of each rep, um, whether they know it or not. It's a totally amazing thing too. And that's, that's, that's the other end of the spectrum of what machines have developed into and maybe back when Xander and those guys were doing it, maybe they stumbled onto a lot of that too. I think that was, well, it was right. I I, I know you haven't been privy to a lot of the stuff, but I did a whole thing on like duplicated movements, which were literally trying to match the output by the person from a person. Xander was, came along and was just like, this is too hard to do all day long. I'm trying to match them with my force. And what's happening is that, I'm getting tired and I'm losing my sense of it because I've got so many patients. So he was trying to create the perfect resistance curve by applying a force if you're doing a side lateral raise by pushing and matching just above or just below what their output was. And so he he designs these machines basically to give himself a break, but there was it was more than just him being tired. It was that he felt like he wasn't very good after about four patients. But also the beauty of him having that much experience in manual resistance, it becomes obvious where they're strong. And That's up right. here it's like, well, man, if I push as hard as I did down here, they can't even get there. That's it becomes right. pretty obvious, not not down to the pound, but, yeah, yeah. general general uh, tendency. Yeah. That's pretty cool. There's a quote well, that I love. We started out with, uh, we started out with some what? Uh, soreness stuff and then turned it into uh, investigation and progression, which related to each other. And then we turned it into business, which makes sense too. And now we're talking about equipment, which in the end could make sense too. Which but pretty much is <laughs> everybody watches like, oh, they're back on equipment again. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, ultimately we, 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 we are uh, addicted to some of these subjects more than others. But um, I'm actually going to have to go here pretty quickly, and I hate to end it, but maybe we can do part two of uh, three guys rambling at some point. <laughs> two guys rambling and one guy hanging out, but I'm certainly happy to host it. I'm really excited about it. But this was great. Tom, thank you so much. Charlie, thanks so much. This was a lot of fun. I loved it. Thank you. Appreciate it. And uh, hopefully it wasn't too rambly. <laughs> no, we'll ramble some more another time. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll talk to you guys soon. Ramble. All right. Thanks. See you.